Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod's Life Ministry. We're sharing the stories and insights of real people living out God's love for the people He's created. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Stephanie Jabauer, and today we're doing a special crossover episode with our friends, the Reverend Mark Kiesling and Juliana Schultz from Engels, the LCMS Youth Ministry Podcast. And so if you know teenagers or young adults in your church, if you have teenagers or young adults in your home, this episode is for you. Mark, Juliana, and I will be talking about a topic all three of us feel needs more attention. How do we care for, love, honor, serve the younger generation, specifically within our own churches? Mark, Juliana, welcome. Would you introduce yourselves? Sure. Thanks for having us. I can get started. My name is Juliana Schultz. I'm a director of Christian education who now serves as a program manager for resources and leadership with LCMS Youth Ministry here in St. Louis. And I'm just excited to be here with you and talking more about young people in the church. Uh, Mark Eastling, director of LCMS Youth Ministry. Great to be here and to have this conversation. Thanks for all you do, Stephanie, and your whole team. It's awesome. <laughs> Looking forward to the discussion today. I uh, live here in St. Louis as well. I uh, work in the International Center primarily with, uh, again, youth ministry pieces, but then also I'm blessed to have a wife that teaches preschool too. And so we get uh, here get the great stories of four and five-year-olds learning about Jesus. Yes. So well, you mentioned my whole team. That would be a, a total of three people <laughs> right? in LCMS Life Ministry. And so I think sometimes, you know, uh, listeners don't realize that when we talk about LCMS Life Ministry, youth ministry, of course, it includes everyone within our church as being part of that. But people working for Synod in Synod, it's just a number of of people, a small group of people. We use the term we a lot, but we don't really indicate that that's not a lot of people, right? Yeah, we we do a lot of things, but it's, yeah, it's not a lot of people here in our office here in St. Louis. At the time that this episode's coming out, the gathering has come and gone, and we praise God for that. What a blessing it is to be able to offer that to our youth, our confirmands, and then those about to graduate high school and then enter into college. I wanted to kind of start with some defining terms here, because when we talk about youth and youth ministry, that can mean different things to different people. What do we mean in a very literal sense by the youth in our church and even youth ministry in our church? Like what age group is that? Yeah, so usually we're talking high school age, so typically like uh, 14 to 18, uh, but then lots of congregations that also includes their junior high students, so that could be anywhere from 5th to 8th grade. For some congregations, when we're talking youth ministry, we're talking as young as 5th grade, but mostly we are ending that kind of after uh, the graduation from high school or, or 18, somewhere in that vicinity. If we're thinking about generationally, um, what that looks like, we were, we always have to remind people that um, youngest millennials are in their mid twenties now. So if you're talking about a young person, you're you're almost exclusively talking about Gen Z. Gen Z, and that can include into young adulthood. So sometimes we'll talk about young people. We usually ter- use that term broadly to mean kind of anybody from like middle school through college age, twenty to twenty five young people. Um, when we talk about youth, we're really usually talking about mostly high school, but about also junior high and high school together. So when, there's so many things I think when we talk about effective or we we have a platform we call healthy youth ministry is that there are things that go across the board for all people of. Um, a young age of all ages. So from baptism to 18, even to young adult years, just those importance of those relationships that happen are just key in the lives of young people. Um, So it doesn't necessarily just fit to the high school age or the middle school, but all ages of young people. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, For the purposes of this conversation today, we're especially referring to the age group that would be in your church's youth group. So Mm -hmm. like Juliana said, fifth graders, but mostly high schoolers in there. And that is now Gen Z, which is nuts because millennials used to be (laughs) the young generation. I'm not that young generation anymore. Hence, the need to talk about it. Now, I am a old millennial in my upper 30s. Yeah, millennials anymore is not synonymous with young people. Mm -hmm. And in fact, now we're hearing more and more about Gen Alpha, which is those that are kind of um, somewhere in that six to eight and younger. Uh, Really, you're talking Gen Z when we're talking about young people in the church. 
Good. You know, this is a podcast about life issues, is centered in the gospel and concern for our neighbor. So now I'm just going to ask you, how is this conversation relevant to our podcast, Friends for Life? How is the care and treatment for the Gen Z generation, especially within our church, a life issue? I was you know, thinking about this when you first invited us to do this crossover, and we had a leadership training uh, in St. Louis. And we were asking them a number of questions. We call it teen talk, talk back time, where we ask them questions and just get their feedback. And they were just kind of doing some creative work. And I loved, overheard the conversation of one who said, I want to be equipped more to talk about life issues with my friends. And oftentimes there's a lot of things behind that that come into that, that either they're walking with a close friend, maybe through some difficult issues, uh, but they also want to be able to articulate as they know that gift of life that God's given to us. Um, they want to be able to speak to that and they want to be able to encourage others. And so I just think, you know, as we treat young people and we talk about treasuring life and treasuring them, we want to treat them in that way as God loves us. Uh, but then also that this is a issue when we talk about life issues. And I think young people are pressed sometimes. And I love about so many of our young people in our church body, they're not wanting to be equipped to go win arguments. They're doing it because they love their neighbor and they love their friends and they see their friends maybe wrestling and struggling and they want to be able to speak the truth of God's word and the gospel into their lives um, and be able to uh, equipped to do that. And so that's one thing I just love about the young people we get to work with and around this issue. That is really their goal is because it is about loving their neighbor from their friends to again, maybe a child or whoever they may know going through issues. I and mean, I just love their heart for that. This Gen Z generation will eventually be the mm -hmm. next generation that will model to the Gen Alpha or whatever generation comes next what it means to serve the church faithfully, love their neighbors within their church body faithfully, and reach out in love towards other people who are unchurched that they might show the love of Christ. And, and then specifically training up this generation of Gen Zs to understand life issues and where the gospel speaks on those issues too. So thank you for that, Mark. You know, as I think of the youths today, it's kind of an intimidating topic for me, for one, because I haven't been that age for a while. So I feel kind of out of touch. Well, I feel 100% out of touch, I will just say, with what is cool, what's going on in, in youth culture today. But I also realize that even as I think I'm a decently perceptive person and one who is fairly positive. I myself have some misconceptions about the youth coming up and growing into the church. And so I guess I assume that other people do too. My question then is, what are some misconceptions people have about the current youth, the Gen Zs of our day, and particularly within the life of the church? I mean, do they get a bad rap and why? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of ways in which I, I wouldn't say maybe a misconception, but just and this is true of all generations, older generations looking at the actions or what they see on the surface for younger generations and going, well, in my day, right. you know, right? Like that's always been true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's nothing new to this scenario. I think we certainly hear a lot of, I would say from, especially from older adults, some judgment around their technology use of young people and how they how they utilize technology and how much they utilize technology and and I think with a with a bit of a misunderstanding of of how much they're using it for school <laughs> for for all of their communication for uh, their sports for uh, you know, there's a necessity at some level now in our society that they be connected in some of those ways and also for the recognition that you know as adults it's hard for us to put down our mm -hmm. phones so to look at an, a young person and be like well I don't understand understand why you aren't you're always on your phone I'm like well but I'm always on my phone so we maybe we haven't taught you well is maybe a part of that I also think that there is a move that young people have especially I see this with young leaders in the church where young leaders ask a lot of questions and they are asking because they are very action oriented. They're entrepreneurial. They want to know where you failed and how you failed and <laughs> what went well so that they can be successful. I mean, essentially it's their strategy for helping set themselves up for success. But older leaders will often find that level of questioning to be like them telling them that they did wrong or that they were 
that what they did in the past was bad and feel like very judged by that, (laughs) feel very almost accused by that. And so often I think that can leave kind of this, why can't young people just do what we tell them to versus young people who really want to take things to the next level and want to have the information they need to get there, uh, maybe not always having that. I just think sometimes where I try to maybe bring requests for for patience and understanding, especially when we're talking with young people outside the church, and there might be an attitude of, well, young people should know better. And I think as uh, fewer and fewer parents and people have been in the church, and especially when we talk about spiritual matters, no, they really shouldn't know better. No one's told them. And so I think we see it, our young people ourselves, I mean, really, they're oftentimes the first people who are telling their friends about Jesus, where I think mm-hmm. that was maybe taken for granted generations before that usually families would have had some sort of connection with the church, probably a church, I should say, at least Christian and Easter maybe had some sort of concept where I really, that's not, that's changed over, I think, generations. And so really we're encouraging our young people. They might be the first ones who really get to talk about the gospel and talk about Jesus. Their friends really don't know better. And what a blessing it is to be able to share the good news into those situations and cherish that rather than be dismissive or upset or angry about maybe someone else's attitude or understanding of scripture or um, religion. What I heard from that, Mark, is that Gen Z, perhaps out of any modern generation prior, is perhaps the most ripe for having the gospel shared with them amongst Mm -hmm. peers, Mm -hmm. because this is kind of a, a new trend in our culture where, as you said, their families may not actually be connected to a church, whereas before it was just you know, part of what families did every Sunday or most Sundays you went to church or at least on Christmas and Easter. But Mm -hmm. this is possibly the first time in recent memory that we have of American generations not having any exposure to church at all or the message of Christ. Right. And with that, you know, we see young people who are really receptive to those mm-hmm. conversations. Gen Z has shown that they're really receptive to spiritual conversations. They want to know uh, what it is that we believe. They're interested in having those conversations. And we can look at statistics that say they carry less baggage mm-hmm. around the church. They're not coming into that gospel with some like hurt that we often saw in maybe previous generations that where they had been injured in some way by the church or they had left because of something that had happened. They really are coming very fresh to that, mm-hmm. which is a new thing that we have to think about. Okay, well, how do I share the gospel in mm-hmm. that scenario? Because we haven't maybe had that with previous generations. Mm-hmm. I'm just thinking very practically of when I see people in our own church, youth, high schoolers come in and actually bring a friend probably because they had to sleep over a Saturday night. They bring a friend into church. It's very possible that that young person has maybe never stepped foot in a church. And so the obvious call would be for that congregation to Mm -hmm. actually extend a hand and welcome that person. Maybe this isn't true for everybody, and I hope it's not, but there's some kind of barrier almost between adults and youth, particularly at this time, where it would be more likely that an adult would go seek out an adult visitor rather than an adult seek out a youth visitor, a a friend of someone in the church coming after a sleep overnight. I think it's certainly more comfortable for adults to talk to adults. I mean, that's going to be true regardless of this scenario that we're in. Mm -hmm. But it tells me how important it is for the young people in your church to have Mm -hmm. supportive adults who they already have a relationship with, Mm -hmm. because then those supportive adults that they already have a relationship with, when they do bring a guest, then it's not hello, uh, stranger, and somebody who I've seen maybe, <laughs> or across. The, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you have a relationship with that young person. Maybe this is a friend they've mentioned to you. Maybe you know a little bit about how they're connected to each other. And you have a place to start that conversation that's a little more comfortable than just greeting a, a young visitor just out of the blue. Because you can and you should, but when you're regular young people, who are in a part of your congregation, have supportive adults who know them, talk to them, who have a relationship with them, then that process becomes a lot easier, I think. We saw some of the research we did that people had stronger connections to their church and retained in the church when they were in a church, grew up in a church where they felt comfortable inviting friends. And I think when that was probably recognized that, oh, you've got a friend with you, or just in general welcoming atmosphere, I think that obviously made an impact on the lives of the young person who was a member of the church too, because they feel valued, uh, they know they're loved, and it was a welcoming place to invite their friends too at different times of their life as well. So it was beautiful to see the Holy Spirit work through that. So at a very 
baseline level, we've already somewhat started to answer our question because what you're talking about is a reliance on an already strong relationship with other adults in the congregation between adults and youth. So at the very least, hopefully adults are in some way involved in these lives of the youth. I don't know what that would look like. Give us some examples. Yeah, a couple examples, I think, you know, to those who are in church work is that they intentionally uh, know names, recognize those young children and then also young adults and youth that are in their churches and certainly the, the different phases they're going through in life. Um, connections that are being made, um, know their families, I think is one place to start to be intentional about that. And certainly there's those, there's spots to check in, confirmation, those type of things, but but be uh, familiar with those times in between too. Are you stopping by the Sunday school class, maybe greeting them at worship, taking time to do that so those relationships get built. And then too, I think in uh, special opportunities too, maybe around service or some other things where you make sure you take the time to greet them and get to know them. I think they're so important. I'm not good with names. I will easily admit that. But yet, so I know that's a challenge for me, but yet I know how important that is too. And to get to know, find that way you can do that, to know their name and call them by name, um, just as they were baptized by that name, to be able to say that and be able to know that I think goes a long way in showing that you are looking out for those young people and finding them is one one easy way that I would recommend for, especially specifically church workers. I think for any adult to be able to, to know the young people in your church. So maybe you're just picking the two kids that are closest to you in the pew because everybody's sitting in virtually the same pews every week, right? So you kind of get to know uh, the, the ones that are around you or, you know, you know, we've, I've had adults in congregations who just, uh, for whatever reason, felt connected or found a connection with a young person. Uh, and we just say, yeah, exactly. Know their names, but then start with a question. Just one question, like, how was your week? What's going on next week? And then build from there, right? Until you can find some commonality, until you kind of get into the rhythm of, of what's going on in their lives. You don't have to be pressing hard on that, but like, hey, what's going on with you next week? Well, then next Sunday, I have a reason to ask you, like, how did that soccer game go? Or, you know, how'd your audition go? And okay, now that I know that your audition got the part, okay, now I'm going to be checking in the following Sunday to say like, okay, well, how are rehearsals going? Then I can get into a rhythm and a pattern and and we start to build some commonality there. That may take a little time, but it's like any other relationship. <laughs> have to kind of work at it a little bit and it's going to feel awkward. So as an adult, trying to to connect with a young person is going to feel a little awkward and it's okay. You just kind of to like kind of breathe your way through that. It's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and the more you do it, the, the easier it gets. You know, we want to speak out to encourage those. I mean, man, those volunteers, Sunday school teachers, yeah. PBS yeah. leaders, all those people. So often it can probably be a thankless job, but man, when we got to see and research and hear the stories that the Holy Spirit uses you to do amazing things um, when you take that time to invest in young people and teach them the word of God and just be in being relationship with them too. You may feel intimidated about that, but man, just showing up and being with the young people and being humble learners along with them, God works through that, which is really cool. And so that, that's something we saw too, that those people who have the time to do that, again, those relationships get built as you start to build that trust and being God's word and talk about it. I mean, really great things happen. A great reason to start your kids young with church as an infant yeah. so that they can start within the church family and be known from infancy through the different, you know, early childhood development. And then when they get into what some would consider the awkward years of middle school and high school, then it won't be so odd to approach them because you already have this relationship with them. Right. And as you know, too, sometimes in those years, they're looking to separate a little bit from mom and dad and they have those other trusted adults that they can go and talk to. I, I certainly hear that a lot from maybe young men I used to coach or whatever. Mom, dad said they, they'll listen to you as much as they'll listen to us. And so mm -hmm. you build those relationships. You get to be those people. That's a real blessing to be the family of God, like you said before, for that young person. Yeah. So I have two church workers in front of me, a pastor and a DCE. So you're ready for this question. What does scripture have to say about the older generations care for mm. the younger? I know one way that I have looked at scripture, maybe through a different lens is especially like I also use as an example, reading the epistles, Paul or others. I'm yet blown away, though, to take a little bit more time, a lens that I've spent more time with, is to read it through the relationships that are behind those letters. 
the care, the love that's there. And so like even at the end of letters, so often I won't read the last few verses of one of Paul's letters. It's just a bunch of names that don't mean anything. Man, it's made me slow down and say like, no, those are people he's taking the time to write, to lift up, sometimes maybe bring a little law too, but then always encouraging in the gospel and reminding them who they are in Christ, who they are as Christians and what it means to be baptized and in the family of God together. Be thinking about those key relationships, how we treat younger people that way too, that they are beloved brothers and sisters in Christ with us. And so what a joy it is. Again, there's obviously the parents be able to teach it, pass it on to their own children, but even within the church, that man, I hope that's a goal as we think about that, as we are instilling and investing and loving on the younger generation, what a blessing that is. I love hearing Mark talk about that because God gave us a congregational, a church community that is intended to be intergenerational. I mean, that's how he he designed it. He designed it to have older adults with wisdom and experience and <laughs> who can come in and with parents who are raising young people and, and with young people who are bringing fresh ideas and those kinds of things. And we see that throughout scripture, right? Uh, we see this call to honor your mother and father because because it will go well with you. And there's some good reasons for that, right? There's some some wisdom that young people need. There's guidance and mentoring that young people need to help them understand their faith and understand how God is at work in their lives and in the lives of others. And God gives adults to young people to, and gives them a role in having those faithful conversations as they walk and as they go throughout their day. But also, I, I look at scripture and look at so many places in which God used young people powerfully to share the gospel, where he used them uh, to make sure that other people knew who he was and to bring him glory and to uh, shine that light in dark places. And in all of those places, that's that's still true today. We have a lot of young people who have a lot of incredibly valuable things that they want to use to live out their vocations and use in the body of Christ as leaders. And we as older adults should be celebrating that and finding ways that God can use them in those ways. So we all need each other for different reasons. And, and I love that you know, you see that throughout scripture, how God calls us to to love and care for each other and that we need each other in the church. And I look at, too, the historical context of the scriptures, of course, <laughs> spanning over years and years from Old and New Testament. Even in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. continuing in, in the New, children, youth were essentially kind of outcasts of society until they turned a specific age where they could contribute to society, specifically young children. It's like, you know, we don't want to see you. We don't want to hear you. You're not really part of our societal realm yet, again, until you can contribute. But in contrast to the context of its time, scripture is sure to point out the church's need to look out for the young the orphans, to care for the spiritual life of the younger generation. And Christ himself, when he walked on this earth, was very quick to rebuke his disciples when they urged mothers and young children away from receiving Christ's blessings. And Christ said, let the children come to me. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He opened this door for us to have this special love for children and young people because the kingdom also belongs to them. This episode is about caring for the younger, looking out for them. How can we bridge that gap that seems to almost inadvertently happen <laughs> between the time of youth and then into adulthood? How can the church do a better job of bridging that gap? So we're starting to answer that question. My next question, though, is how have we gotten to where we are? Even 50 years ago, there was a structure within the church that allowed intergenerational relationships to happen. So am I assessing this correctly? <laughs> I guess what's happened that there's such a, a gap between the generations? I think a couple of things. I mean, one, I, I do think, uh, you know, especially when you look at maybe within the LCMS context and, and others too, is that certainly there was more the, you stayed close to home, um, you worked the family farm, you worked the family business. So you knew grandpa and grandma, we weren't a mobile society just in general. And, you know, I'd say probably post-World War II, college became more of the norm uh, for people to get out of high school, go off to college, meet someone who's, you know, in our context, not German, not Lutheran, um, you know, that type of thing. And so it kind of caused a, a different uh, situation from a family standpoint in terms of what we saw. So there weren't just those nat natural family built in, as well as then the church probably being much more a focus of the overall daily life 
that you see now. Now there's a lot of factors to that, but definitely I think that was more of a, you know, your Boy Scout troop, your sports, everything was in the church quite often, much more, um, where now those maybe have come outside affiliations to where that's taken place. I think too, you know, we see it um, in terms of the, the time that gets placed then into say school and other activities um, there, uh, that there's a lot of call on time. So I think there's a little bit more families that are living individual lives rather than communal um, than in the past. Um, just the busyness of life in general. And there is just kind of, again, I think that desire to where we've got our time, we got to manage that. We got all these things we want to do, get make judgments on how that time's being used maybe. Uh, but yet there wasn't necessarily the activities that got, brought us together um, and that focus on that time maybe in church. Now, again, there's some great other vocational stuff that's happening uh, that just looks different, but maybe it won't, it's not in such larger groups where there's that intergenerational connection happening that maybe did in the past. And so that's where, again, there's that important for breathing into, and investing into parents is there uh, maybe feeling more, sometimes more isolated maybe in that, in terms of doing that in group, or, but they're also finding their relation and connections too, through school and other places, maybe the church or Lutheran school, if they're in a, that setting too, uh, but might look different than what it did generations before. We also to remember that like we were having uh, young people's leagues as early as, you know, the late 1800s, right? So this, this youth ministry is not like a new thing. <laughs> I mean, I guess in, in the scheme of all of creation, it is very new, but I mean, it's something we've been doing for a while, right? And the question has always been a balance of the importance of an intergenerational, interconnected congregation and the value that there is in having educational Bible study time, program time with your peers um, at an age appropriate level. It's not necessarily anything new. I do think we do see some of that separation happen, both as Mark pointed out, as adolescence expands, right? As the time that is, we would consider adolescence as in between childhood and adult time kind of gets longer and longer. And when we as a culture sort of start to idealize being young <laughs> and idolize uh, youth to some degree. And as that relationship changes in a wide culture, that we do get some kind of this feedback in the church where then there seems to be more and more separation. And I think this is important sometimes to tell adults. I mean, it's maybe a little bit unfair, but I think there was one of the slogans of kind of baby boomers was don't trust anyone over 30. <laughs> and I think, and I think they kind of carry that too. Like I still viv very vividly remember my dad, he's my dad's a pastor and saying, he goes, I'm not doing youth ministry. And I was like, why not? Like my friends want you to be in our youth ministry. Like we have questions. We want you to be a part of it. And he's like, cause I'm too old. And he wasn't that old. And I think he <laughs> still had this mentality that like, you won't trust me. And I think youth are seeking those trustworthy relationships and they want to have those relationships. And I think too easily we're like, ah, there's this wall. And sometimes we might need to take that step into that, but I think we have to get through that first fear to say like, no, they want those relationships. And that was maybe one generation that really had that attitude. And we need to get past that and be able to say like, no, we can, if we take the initiative, um, this is really a fruitful thing that can happen. Hmm. So in some ways, nothing's really new under the sun because right. <laughs> it sounds like we've always kind of struggled with this very issue. What Juliana said, what you said earlier too, it's like, I learn quickly, you know, to work with young people. I'm not worried about being cool. I'm not cool. No. I wish I wish I were. I'm just not. <laughs> so just be yourself. And <laughs> so yeah. that I've done a lot better just being myself than trying to be cool. And so I think there's that authentic side of it when you're building those relationships that can be uh, a real good thing. And as somebody who was not popular when they were a teenager, <laughs> then being with teenagers does sometimes bring up that like extra nervousness of like, well, I wasn't cool when I was their age. So what makes me think I'm cool now? And like, the reality is like, I have to recognize that that's about me and my experience mm. and even my hangups, even for my youth ministry time. And really all they want is for me to be who I am and to bring what I am to the table. And to genuinely care about who they are in Christ and to know not just their names, but how God has made them and what makes them unique and to love them as I'm called to love them as a part of my body of Christ. And it does take a little bit of getting over yourself a little bit <laughs> to step into that space. Well, I can verify that just personally, because there are some young people where I actually have to work up courage to, uh, yeah. to say yeah. hello to them, because I know that despite the <laughs> kind smile on my face or words that I say, it's going to be met with a blank stare <laughs> and really like, well, what do I say now? Because I've said everything. So now it's your turn to talk. 
you know, and it's, yeah, it's this art to have these conversations with young people people. And I'm sure that listeners who are wanting to learn more about this art can go back to previous episodes that <laughs> you have done and end goals to learn more ways to connect with younger people in practical ways. Well, and, uh, you know, if it's any sense of encouragement, like I've had two weekends recently where I've, I've got to spend a lot of times with young people and, and I had an incident where I like, I greeted a young person. I knew them, I greeted them by name and they looked at me and then they walked away. Like that was it. That was the whole encounter. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm not sure what that was, but that, you know, right. But like you, and you get back at it and, you know, I did it again and followed up with her later in the weekend and we had a good conversation, but it was like, you know, you're not always going to do it perfectly. Uh, but we trust that the Holy Spirit is work even in those moments, even if that to me felt really awful in the moment, God was working in that, that young person now at least knows that I know their name. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. <laughs> even if I thought that experience was weird, then we have this opportunity to go like, okay, God work through that. However you're going to, and use that as a way for me to help share that gospel and your love with another young person in my church. Well, Juliana, what you had said earlier too, you have to remember uh, these interactions are not about me really, right? Yeah. No, no interaction really is. It, it's about loving and, and caring for your neighbor. So to, <laughs> to kind of put ego aside and to reach out regardless of the response you're going to get is, is always the right thing to do. As Mark mentioned too, to be <laughs> authentic um, as yourself rather than try to be cool with the younger generations. I mean, people really of all ages can sniff out <laughs> inauthenticity very easily, but particularly I would imagine this Gen Z group. Then my next question would be, how do we as a church today help foster authentic relationships mm. between this Gen Z group, millennials and above. Like what what are actually some really practical ways? Are are these programs? Are these what one might consider air quote organic <laughs> interactions? I mean, what did what do we even do? Because we got to do something or else we I mean, we can't just talk in theory about it, right? I, I mean, to act is is better. So, what are some ideas for churches and me <laughs> as a churchgoer? The first two things that come to my mind are are listening well, learning how to ask a question and then not respond, just listen and ask another question and ask another question and really understand where that young person is coming from and what they're thinking and what their situation is. I think often adults make assumptions about what's going on in a young person's life and then they speak very quickly without listening well. And that for this generation can really stymie a relationship building, it can be really hard for them. And so for this generation in particular, you really have to earn the right to be heard by them. They have a lot of voices speaking to them. And what's going to make you different than literally any of the thousands of other voices that are trying to speak at them every day is for you to be able to listen to them while really understand. And then in that, you're better able to share law and gospel with them, <laughs> you're better able to to speak God's word to them in, in a way that's going to resonate and be heard by them. Sometimes there may need to be some intentionality about how those relationships get built. It may not be as organic as we'd like it. And some of those things are simply introducing younger people to older generations. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. If it's everything, if you've got a Bible class, is to literally talk about the young children and we're going to pray for these young children. Maybe you can get a picture of them so that they get to re- familiar who they are. Um, so you can lift them up. They know their name and they start to talk to them at church on Sunday because they get to know them a little bit. Obviously we do as commanded, we pray for our young people, for all the people of God. Um, and so we build up that way. I mean, one thing that came out of the pandemic that I loved our church when we were doing kind of more video church, who's not going to listen to a cute kid making the announcements for church. So then all of a sudden the announcement <laughs> came tame and here it comes like, Oh, it's a familiar, it's the kid that sits in front of me at church. Oh my goodness. Oh, how cute is that? And so like another way to lift up young people, like, Hey, you can read a script. You got up there and read a script about the announcement. That's great. And like to lift them up as leaders and to have that face up there to say like, Hey, they can do this stuff. Um, and so really some great stuff. I think that came out of that, but just to lift them up and be able to, you know, again, make those connections. So they visually, they, you know, they see them. I see you, they see the young person, uh, see that they are a gift from God. And so then they start to make those connections to where then hopefully that maybe breaks down some of those barriers for an older adult to come up and 
be able to connect with a young person. Because I think, again, sometimes the old, older person might be more intimidated than the young kid. And really, it, it, some really great stuff can happen when those connections get made. So sometimes there are some programmatic, intentional things you can do to make those connections happen and break down some of the, those barriers uh, that might not be as organic. But I think, I think some of the other stuff, too, I mean, we've talked about is just encourage adults that in those times of Sunday school or just Sunday morning, you know, go out of your way when it's time to pass the peace, make sure you pass the peace with the child. Um, if there's a greeting time, greet the child, help them see that they are loved and seen as well, that I can think can be a really wonderful thing in the life of the church. One of those great ways that I've seen this happen in the churches is when you get a chance to serve together and not serve each other. Serve Well, so maybe you're having a project at church. Um, for us, one of those ways that we did that was with Christmas decorations, right? And how are we making sure that we're inviting all different ages to that? And we're letting some of the older adults kind of mentor young people and how to how do we set up that tree? That tree is very complicated. All of those different pieces that we have that chance. And that within that, you have that shared activity that kind of makes it the conversation around that natural. So lots of times serving together in the church, serving together in BBS or bringing in young people who are helping with set up for an event. There is something about doing that action together, mm -hmm. having yeah. that common goal that can kind of really break down some of those kind of natural nervousness because it's easier to start asking questions when you're shoving chairs at a table. There's something about that that is, as, is naturally really helpful and it helps to get some of those conversations started. What I'm hearing you say, Juliana, for listeners who are listening, because it's less likely we're going to have actual youth <laughs> listening than we are, you know, millennials and a little bit older. What I'm hearing you say is that some of this is going to be the parent's prerogative and it probably needs to start earlier than high school age sure. to bring the children along with them to these service mm -hmm. events make the child do that. Have them sign up along with you to help in these things because it's probably not very likely that your youth is going to take that responsibility on for themselves. And, and I have to give a lot of credit to my parents for kind of just naturally bringing me along with these kind of things. Um, sometimes I, I just simply didn't have a choice whether I was going to, you know, youth group or not. And that's got to be OK because they're the parent. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, just kind of, again, naturally, my parents involved me in the life of the church and in mm -hmm. different, you know, we had a cookie bake sale and I went and did rolling out the dough and, and decorating with my mom. And that wasn't an unusual usual thing for me. And so my parents taught me what it looks like even as a youth to be involved in the church. And so hopefully that would carry itself on. And I'm also thinking, because I have no experience in youth ministry whatsoever, but I've had these thoughts before of why don't we ever, um, you know, we have Mother's Day banquets or Father's Day outings or whatever, or we, um, we have special services that recognize veterans or special services that recognize grandparents or, or what have you. But have we ever had a dinner that recognizes our youth? Maybe a great time to do it would be a month or so before you send your youth off to the youth gathering is to put together a banquet that celebrates this age and that prays for them as they go out. And I, and I think what a surprise to do it. And it's not one of their fundraisers <laughs> that you, yes. you, throw yeah. an, you throw an event for them um, because yeah. we love and care about you and to celebrate you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. and one of my, my favorite events I think I've ever done is we had one Sunday school. I was, we were going to have low attendance for whatever reason. And, and so the whole Sunday school hour, we brought everybody together. We said, Hey, we want you to bring an object that's important to you that you could tell a three minute story about. And we put our older adults in the center of that circle and we put our younger people in the outside circle so that the older person would tell their story, then the younger person would tell their story, then I would have everybody switch and they would move down a seat and they would do the same thing. You know, you're telling your story back and forth and, and then you just kind of went around a circle. We did obviously like some a, a short devotion that was tied to that, but oh man, did we come back and I had young people who were like, did you know that they collect classic cars are so cool, <laughs> right? And then we had older adults who were like, oh my goodness, your young people have really interesting stories and thoughtful thoughts. And I was like, yeah, you guys actually would get along if you just... <laughs> Right. Uh, we had we had people who brought pictures of their wedding days who'd been married for more than 50 years and for young people to hear that and understand like and have that picture in their head versus we had uh, young people who uh, who brought things that were really important to them in their lives right now and for adults to hear what our young people valued it was a really great moment so finding 
big in little ways to have those moments where we can share that narrative together. And I think that's scriptural, mm-hmm. right? And we think about how many times in the Old Testament God told his people to like, here's a pile of rocks so that you can remember <laughs> the thing that God had done. And how are mm-hmm. we sharing stories with each other that remind us of the things that God has done in our lives and in the lives of others? It's a great spot in which to build some really authentic and valuable relationships. Good point. I'm also hearing let's not just relegate the youth's involvement to a job that's not so fun, which is acolyting. There are uh, other things in addition they can do. I mean, maybe acolyting is for youth. I don't know. But let's give them more opportunities to serve in ways that suit their specific gifts as well. If that's the only area we have for youth to be involved in our church service or to be involved in the life of the church, I can see why it would be enticing for youth to not continue down the pattern of involvement within the church. Finally, as we're wrapping up here, since you both are very gifted in the realm of youth ministry and outreach, I want people to have one takeaway from the conversation we're having. What is one thing they can keep in mind when they're interacting with Gen Z at church? Young people today are incredibly creative and empathetic and entrepreneurial. They're great problem solvers. Uh, There is a lot that is wonderful about this generation uh, that we often overlook in some ways unprepared to manage (laughs) in our current structures in the church. And so maybe my one encouragement would be to find a couple of young people in your church who you can get to know individually, but then also think of ways that you can help create structures in which young people can be seen and known and use their gifts within the church, right? God has blessed us with these young people. They are uh, incredibly gifted. They are passionate about the gospel. They want other people to know who Jesus is, and often they go overlooked. And so if you can contribute to making sure they're seen and known and heard, but then also that they have opportunities to use their gifts. Um, that's like six things and not one, but I, it was yeah, short. I was, I was so really I think trying it to counts. say, what was the one? Julia? No, no, sure. I got, yeah. it was short, <laughs> but it was like six things. All right. It was, part, that's right. it was part of Juliana's answer. And I think she said it earlier too. The one thing I probably would have said is to listen well. And in that, that's a, that's a pretty uh, humbling thing to do oftentimes. And I always appreciate, again, someone really smarter than us that kind of gave the phrase that I repeat a lot is that we were all young once, but we were mm-hmm. never young at this time. Um, mm-hmm. And I think to think about the cultural effects on our young people, and not that everything's bad, but there's a lot of positive things too with the, I mean, you know, how intelligent they are and how, the entrepreneurial side of it and that type of thing. But I mean, to, to really listen to what is affecting them, the questions they have. And that again, I, I really appreciate, I think Julie touched on this, but I think of this when working with young people is the questions they ask are not because they're necessarily doubting or they're trying to push back. They are generally curious because they have so much information at their fingertips. They have such ability to think through these things is to be able to try to answer those questions. Sometimes we don't always have the answers too. We got to point them other places, but to listen to those questions well and man, cherish the fact that they trust you enough to ask you the questions rather than getting defensive or, or why are you asking those questions? And that they are, I mean, sometimes, yes, you'll have some maybe that are being a little pointed with it, but by and large to cherish those times that you get to say that. And I, I just always think I've heard this a lot too, that I think with, with just this generation, I think it started with millennials. We probably have to be better at answering the question why and explaining why we do what we do. Cause they're not going to say, mm-hmm. you said it, Steffi, they're not going to just show up maybe and acolyte without understanding Boy, acolyting is a important part of the worship service and preparing us, our hearts and minds for worship, um, the light of Christ. I mean, all those things you can go through and explain that well, why we do that, why it's an important role, rather than just saying, well, it's just what you do when you're in fifth grade and no real mm-hmm. explanation about why it's important. Um, and so I think the church can always do better than that. I think we we lose those that great history, the scriptures, our confessions, all those things that explain the why we do what we do. And to be able to explain that in, again, a great way and be able to just be consistent in doing that is a real great gift uh, to the church. What you're going to hear is that Mark and I cannot give you just one thing. Yeah, Mark and I will give there you, you a dozen there you things. There you go. The one and thing. Then, but ultimately, uh, young people are awesome and yes. uh, love them well. And listen I think, well. There you go. Yeah, There's, there my we one go. There's my one thing. 
this is all gold. So maybe I shouldn't have made you just say say one. But <laughs> an overall theme that I heard from both of you two melding together is really humility. Mm-hmm. Humble yourselves. Mm-hmm. As Christ considered himself a a servant to all, adults need to remember to offer humility to the younger because it's not natural Mm -hmm, for us. mm -hmm. And and so we can honor them and respect them in that way, too, because any generation and all generations are beloved generations of the body of Christ. And so we need to recognize them as such. Again, how will they know unless we model it for them? We cannot blame them for not knowing (laughs) or doing what we have not taught them or passed down to them. That is the job of the older generation. So, yeah, we can wag our finger all we want at these younger kids who are on their iPhones too often or whatever. But again, if if we're not helping and teaching and discipling them well... We cannot expect them to live up to those standards without modeling those ourselves. So Mark and Juliana, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to share with us so that we can learn and better serve the Gen Z and Alpha Gen or whoever's (laughs) coming next, Gen Alpha, (laughs) who come after us. Uh, It was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. New episodes drop twice each month. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that introduces listeners to life issues by introducing them to friends who stand for life.